Braxton Garrett is breaking out. We had some big injuries. Plus, our Week 14 preview is up next on a Kokomo Friday. Alcantara, Soroka, you look so good in Boca. Peralta, Manoa, Balsak, Ferrari, Nola, Chilito, Castillo, Yoshida, Mosin, Tiktok, Gano, and Fado. Now you're so high, but it ain't be so low. Frank Clubs, hit some kind of show. Now let's get on with the show. Happy Cocoa Ball Friday and welcome in to Fantasy Baseball today on June 23rd. I am Frank Sample, joined by Scott White and Chris Towers. It's been a while since we've had all three of us here on a Friday. Today on the show, the Braxton Garrett breakout is real. Blake Snell is on one of those runs, big injuries, and our Week 14 preview. Before we get started, please like this video and subscribe on YouTube if you haven't already. And if you're listening on the audio side, download, follow, and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. We really do appreciate it. Chris, welcome back to a Friday. Yeah, I'm realizing I, I, it's been a long time since I've heard Kokomo. So it was, it was good to hear that. It was nice to bop my head. And now let's let's talk about some, some Miami Marlins. Yeah, let's... Miami Marlin, I guess. <laughs> I love that you're rocking the old school Florida Marlins. Oh, yeah. Too. That's great. Uh, let's jump in. Oh, my good goodness gracious. Atta girl, Susan. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. The Yankees got destroyed. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Chris, we'll go right back to you. Your uh, player of the night. Yeah, it's Braxton Garrett, who had 13 strikeouts over seven innings against the Pirates, who it's worth noting have been pretty bad. For a while, was it nine straight losses for the Pirates or nine out of their last 10, something? It's been a pretty rough stretch for your Pittsburgh Pirates. But yeah, Braxton Garrett has been pretty incredible of late. This is, let's see, six of his last seven starts. He's allowed two earned runs or fewer. 13 strikeouts this start, eight the previous one, nine in the start before that. It's been a pretty remarkable run for a guy who I think we've all kind of pegged as just fine. You know, not not someone who we've thought there was much reason to get excited about. But, you know, even even still, we've all liked him. You know, we've all thought he was worth adding. But at this point, I mean, he's I think 71 percent rostered. And after a start like tonight, I don't think it's a stretch to say that that's probably 29 percent too low. For Braxton hmm. Garrett. Now, I, I don't think he's going to keep, you know, certainly not double digit strikeout efforts going, but even, you know, his overall dominance lately is probably over, over, over his head. But I mean, his sliders are really, really good pitch. It's 46% whiff rate. His curveball uh, has a twin or no, sorry. His changeup has a 39% whiff rate this year, 31% on a new cutter. And so you add it all up. He's throwing his four seam fastball a lot less too, which got crushed last season and it's getting crushed this season. And I don't know. This guy's got 90 strikeouts and 76 and two thirds innings. He's got like a two eight FIP. He might just be pretty good. I don't know. Where are you guys at on Braxton Garrett? Well, uh, yes, I agree in most respects there. So he has a two ERA, a 0.8 whip, a 12.4 K per nine over his last eight starts. That's, Obviously not something he can sustain, but it is eight starts with dominant ratios. And I will point out last year uh, around this time, we were getting pretty, or at least I was getting, uh, you know what? It actually started a little later than this, but toward in the summer months last year, uh, Braxton Garrett went on a run that made him relevant in fantasy. Also made him somebody we were talking about as a potential pickup for weeks at a time. Uh, began July 4th, actually, of last year. Eight starts, stretchy at a 291 ERA with more than a strikeout per inning, and that's when the slider first started to pop, and we we're like, maybe there's something here. Uh, as people who've been listening to this show regularly this year know, my, my main issue with Braxton Garrett during this great stretch that has now peaked with this 13-strikeout effort 
was that he was getting pulled early from games. Mm -hmm. His first 12 starts, he only once did he go six innings. And I believe he had just two wins during that stretch. So as, as well as he was pitching, as much as the Marlins as were winning as a team, uh, Garrett was not joining in that. Mm -hmm. he, he wasn't collecting that most valuable of statistics for, for pitchers to win in fantasy. It's, it's the most valuable one. It's not always the most predictable, but it's the most valuable. And so, you know, I, I wondered if, if he was really worth pursuing for that reason, particularly if you're talking about leagues, 12 teams or fewer, but all of a sudden he had his second six inning start last time out. And now it's a seven inning start. So all of a sudden that seems like a non-issue. And, and this is the, the difficulty in playing that workload game. <laughs> doing workload analysis is it could change very suddenly or it could not. And I, I do think it is an important aspect to determining how valuable a pitcher is in fantasy. It's really hard for guys who don't go six consistently, unless they just have overpowering ratios. It's really hard for them to make a, a significant fantasy impact, but teams can develop more trust in pitchers. They can start leaving them in games longer. And, and usually success is what brings this about. Garrett, of course, has had lots of success recently. So in a way, it's not surprising, but it's not a guarantee to happen either. So um, so I guess if you missed out on him because I said, ah, he's never going to get three wins, I'm going to backtrack a little on that now. And, and so I'm sorry you missed out on him based on that. Still don't know that he's going to start going six innings with regularity just because he's done it two starts in a row. But I think it, like, it seems more possible now than it did uh, those other times we talked about Braxton Garrett. And one thing that I think is worth adding on that note is something that we talked about with Taj Bradley yesterday. I think it was yesterday. It might've been the day before uh, time is a flat circle, but he is pitching deeper into games, you know, six innings last start out seven this time, only 90 pitches in the previous start, only 88 in this one. Now that's not a bad thing. Getting through six innings with 90 pitches that's a really good thing. Getting through seven with 88 pitches, that's incredible. But it's not, it suggests to us that next time out, if he's not going to throw 98 pitches, he's probably still more of a five and done kind of guy. And second or third but, time through but, the order. But just to, you know, counterpoint there, he's been this efficient. Like he, those sure. starts where he was getting pulled early, he was throwing yeah, like was, 75 to 80. Yeah, pitches. 80 pitches. It's, yeah. It's, it's not like he's just been unusually efficient these last two starts, and that's why they let the, him go deeper. The bigger issue, and the one that feeds this, is he has a 951 OPS, or he had a 951 OPS the third time through the order coming into yeah. this start. Now, he did go, looks like two innings through the third order, third part of the order, gave up a double. And that was the only uh, hit that he allowed. I think he had three or four strikeouts among the seven batters he faced a third time. So that's pretty good because he only had six strikeouts and 48 plate appearances the third time through the order before this start. So, you know, mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing where we're seeing a bit more of a varied pitch mix from Braxton Garrett. Like I mentioned, he's got that cutter that he's throwing that he introduced this season. He's also got you know, curveball that he throws right around 10% of the time, a changeup right around 10% of the time. And so maybe having a little deeper of an arsenal can help Braxton Garrett with that third time through the order. And that's going to be the key to unlocking, you know, and sustaining some kind of upside. If, if he can do that, then I think we'll see some more six inning starts. But right now, I think it's very fair to be skeptical of that. As we mentioned, Braxton Garrett, 71% rostered, so it could be out there in some shallower leagues. Does have a tougher test next week at the Boston Red Sox, who are fourth in Woba against left-handed yeah. pitching. And we've got decisions to make. If we want Braxton Garrett to be 100% rostered, uh, I moved him up to a range in the rankings, which is right around guys like Emmett Sheehan and Gavin Williams. Scott, would you take Braxton Garrett over either of those after this dominant outing? Hmm. Well, that's the right range. I think I'd slot him right between those two. I think I'd go Williams one, Garrett two, 
Emmett Sheehan three. Uh, but like Emmett Sheehan could change that very quickly. Uh, he's made one career start and there were good points and there were bad points. So I, like, I really need to see more from Sheehan to know what we're working with, but that's where I'd slot him right now, right? Between Williams and Sheehan. All right. Oh my goodness gracious. We'll slide over to you, Scott. Who you got? I'm going to go with Bryce Elder who just kept doing typical Bryce Elder things in this start Thursday through seven shutout innings against the Phillies. And, um, you know, obviously we've been calling him a regression candidate basically from the start of the year. I, th I think most everybody who analyzes fantasy baseball has. And it kind of looked like maybe it was starting his first couple starts in June, four and runs in six innings, five earned runs in five and a third innings. Here we go. But then the last two starts, one and run in six, and then, you have the seven shutout innings in this one. His ERA for the season now is back down to 240. Yeah, 240. 240 Bryce Elder has after 15 starts. So half a season, and it's taken him to a 240 ERA. And this, by the way, is following a stretch at the end of last season. Uh, let me find it exactly. His last five starts last season, Bryce Elder had a 165 ERA. And I, I feel like that's always even more telling if, if a player is able to carry over the success from the previous year. I, I don't know. That, that, that always feels like it has more staying power to me. And yet, for half a season, I've continued to insist, okay, he can't keep this going. But after this time, you know... It, it, it may be time to include to conclude that he's just a unicorn. And in fact, there was a tweet today by a data, data analyst, a contributor to Baseball Prospectus by the name of Robert Orr. And I'll just read the tweet to you. If you are wondering how Bryce Elder has a sub-3 ERA while sitting 89 to 90, this is it. It's nearly the steepest sinker in MLB, so it constantly gets beaten to the dirt. Uh, and then he goes on to say it has very little wiggle. I don't know exactly what he means by that, but it doesn't move side to side. It just basically dives straight down. Okay. So it's, so it's a sinker with unique properties and, you know, sometimes what gets lost in these exit velocity discussions with pitchers or I guess hitters too, uh, because, you know, in, in addition to not getting many strikeouts, elder has, he, he, he gives up hard contact. So like everything, it seems like everything's working against him. He's going to have to collapse. But if you're giving up ground balls at the rate he is, which is now I think up to 57%, um, and they're a certain kind of ground ball that gets beat straight into the dirt, so it, it loses its velocity very quickly, then the exit velocity doesn't matter. But right? ground balls in general produce a higher exit velocity than fly balls. And when, when they're a certain characteristic of ground ball, they, you know, they, they lose that velocity more quickly. And I, I think that may be what's happening here with, uh, with Bryce elder. And again, like I said, we're, we're talking about a 20 start stretch that's continued from one start to another, where he's just been excellent at run prevention. And uh, I think I'm done doubting it. I'm, I'm not saying he's going to finish the year with the 240 ERA, but are, are you going to, are we going to be talking about Bryce Elder at any point uh, about dropping Bryce Elder at any point? I don't, I don't think so unless he gets hurt. I think he's here to stay. Yeah. And I was looking into him on Thursday. I was updating my pitcher rankings and I kind of came to the same conclusion that I, I think we just kind of need to trust it, right? He gets so many ground balls, as you mentioned, Scott, and he has two secondary pitches in his slider and changeup that are both good enough. I don't think that either one is great. But entering the start, his slider had a 162 batting average against with a 33% whiff rate. That's a very good pitch. It's not a great pitch. His changeup, 205 batting average against, 29% whiff rate. It's a solid pitch. Probably helps him get left uh, lefties out. I think all of that, combined with the sinker, it, it's probably enough. And he pitches on one of the best teams in baseball, too. So should get some run support and uh, obviously lots of wins there as well for Bryce Elder. I moved him up to SP44. Might be aggressive, but... With everything he's done this season and just kind of looking into him a little bit further, this was the conclusion that I came to as well. And uh, I'm pretty much buying it. Chris? I can't move him that high, but I, I 
he's 56 for me. Maybe I can move him a little higher than that. I, I think like we have to calibrate what Bryce Elder is for real means, right? Because he's got a 240 ERA. And I would probably, if you added a run and a quarter to that, I think that would probably be a reasonable rest of season approximation of what he's likely to do. That I'm gonna being add less said, to it than that, but what's that? I'm going to add less to it than that, but go ahead. I mean, a 365 ERA is really good. You know, I'll, I'll like put him at a three. I'll put him at a three twenty ERA the rest of the way. Yeah, I, I mean, a little bit ambitious. He's I was probably a top he's... ten, maybe top five Cy Young guy if he has a three twenty ERA the rest of the way, and maybe he'll be that. I look, I I have no idea, but like this is not just a doubting Bryce Elder thing. I I have similar concerns about Marcus Stroman. That's not to say I don't think they'll be useful moving forward, but I I don't think just because they've put up sub two five ERAs so far means they're likely to do anything close to that moving forward. And while yes, Bryce Elder does seem to be an outlier one as a general rule, you're not going to go broke betting against outliers. Just that's a, that's a useful heuristic to approach fantasy baseball with. You're not always going to win, but generally speaking, you're going to go right more often than not. And As good as he's been, as much weak contact as he allows, all that stuff, like that's baked into the the various stats that we use. And those various stats aren't always perfect. Kyle Hendricks outran his peripherals for years. But Bryce Elder does have a 391 XERA right now. So that takes into account, as best as we can approximate, the quality of contact that he's allowing in addition to the other metrics that we uh, look at. And so... Right, but I, I'm saying I'm giving that, him that more quality, credit. I'm, I'm giving that, him more credit than that. No, I'm I'm saying 360 ERA. I, I'm I'm being perfectly fair to Bryce Elder, I think, but it's it's still just to say that like I still think he's an obvious sell high candidate. And and I the comp I would use, not necessarily like a perfect player comp, but in terms of the results would be Martin Perez, who at a similar point last season, I was looking very dumb about my skepticism of Martin Perez. And he ended up being a pretty good pitcher for pretty much the entire season. He had a 220 ERA as of June 27th. It was his 15th start. Bryce Elder made his 15th start today. I believe. Martin Perez had a 350 ERA last season. Now the offensive environment's a little different. There are more runs being scored this year. And so a 350 ERA last year is probably more like a 370 ERA. So again, I'm giving Bryce Elder a little more credit than that, but it's just, Mm -hmm. he doesn't get a lot of strikeouts. He's got good, but not elite control. He's got a lot of ground balls, but not necessarily elite quality of contact suppression. And so I add it all up and it's just, I remain skeptical of a sub three ERA. That is a different thing than I think he's bad. Yeah. You're wanting to give him a high threes ERA though. I don't know. We, uh, we, we, we've spent enough time talking mid. about a guy who's universally rostered, probably, so we can move on. But I, I still think I will take every opportunity to sell high on Bryce Elder that I can. Okay. okay. Well, uh, put a bow on this because we've done the thing now where we've talked about two players in a matter of 20 minutes. But uh, I move Bryce Elder ahead of names like Chris Bassett, Lucas Gilito, Luis Severino, who's lost right now, and Sonny Gray. And if you look at the expected ERA for all of those guys... It's also not really good. So sure. I think that's just a range in the rankings where, you know, it's it's close. Like, you you know, it's you're picking nits again. But I, I just think uh, with what Bryce Elder has done so far, and again, even if he's like a mid to high threes ERA, he's probably in a similar range of skill level with those other pitchers I just mentioned. Sure. Uh, quick, oh, my goodness gracious for me is uh, Michael Garcia. I spoke about him the other day and. and Wanted to give him a little bit more credit. He had a great game here on Thursday, two for four with three steals, two runs, and an RBI. It was his first time leading off the season for the Royals. And over his last eight games, he has 13 hits, a home run, and five steals. He's batting 287 now on the season. The plate discipline is okay, about an 8% walk rate, 21% strikeout rate. Expected numbers look fine. And he hits the ball really hard, 92.2 average exit velocity, 52% 52% hard hit rate, and he's 68th percentile in sprint speed. Uh, Michael Garcia had 39 steals in the minors last year. I just think that he is really under-rostered. 
at least for what he's shown over the past like couple of weeks, 9% rostered. I think if you play in a deeper category league or even a 12-team roto league, you might have some utility for this guy, either as a corner or a middle infielder. Uh, he's providing some batting average and speed, has third base and shortstop eligibility. I am pretty interested in what we've seen from Michael Garcia. Are either of you? Not really. I know. Uh, you, I brought him up the other day. You didn't like him either, but I don't know. I'm, I'm interested. Yeah. I Not really. The weird the, thing is how much of his value is coming from stolen bases when he doesn't he doesn't rate out as a particularly fast base runner. I think you said 60-something percentile in sprint speed, 68th percentile in sprint speed. And, like, he's got 10 steals in, what is it, 51 major league games for his career. 10 of them in 50, 42 games this season. He had 16 and 64 games at triple. I mean, I guess. I don't know. He might just be a. Yeah. He hit, he hit 39 in the minors last yeah, year. Yeah. Right? Might just he, be a better base runner it's, than it's his sprint speed. Functional speed than, yeah. than uh, you know, maybe pure speed. And, and maybe he'll continue doing that. But I, I feel like Michael Garcia is from the uh, Luis Arias, Ramon Arias, basically every infielder <laughs> named Arias vein where he's going to have stretches where he's usable, but in the long run is the numbers are going to be pretty mediocre. He's going to be fat. He's going to steal more bases than those guys, but he's probably yeah. going to hit fewer homers. And yeah, I think that's probably yeah. fair. Definitely fewer homers, but I'm pretty confident he hits the ball harder than those guys as well. So uh, maybe it could lend itself to a higher batting average than anything we've seen from those players. But if he's leading off, I think obviously that can add to his value as well uh, with the run scored and volume of plate appearances. So again, if you do play in a categories league, you need some speed or batting average. The name there, Michael Garcia. Wanted to give a shout out to Byron Buxton, who we've been waiting for a while to see some kind of positivity. And he did exactly that on Thursday, two for four with a double dong. He's up to 13 home runs. His first homer of the day, 112.2 exit velocity, 466 feet. His second homer of the day, 111.9 exit velocity, 465 feet. That's not normal. <laughs> that's that's really impressive stuff. It's now it's putting it to be, uh, together more consistently, staying on the field. I mean, these are the things we talk about a lot for Byron Bucks. I believe this is the first time in the Statcast era that a player has had two home runs of at least 460 feet. That that's impressive. Surprise me. Yes, it is an amazing feat. Um, but now we just need to see it uh, a little bit more consistently. And he's Byron not Bucks. healthy. I mean, there, there's been some pretty candid quotes from Rocco Baldelli where he just, they've straight up said he's not going to play the outfield this season. He's not physically capable of playing the outfield. So I I, I think there are going to remain, uh, it's knee issues still from the off-season issues that he had. So that's frustrating, but you know, he is what he is, a very good player. All right, let's take our first break. And when we return, we'll get to those two big injuries from Thursday right after this. It's Big Three Hoops on CBS, and the Trilogy Dynasty is back. Will anyone stop the champs this season? Big Three Hoops, Sunday on CBS. Welcome back, and a quick reminder to download and follow our five-minute podcast, Fantasy Baseball Today in Five. If you're watching us live on YouTube, pull out your phone, scan that QR code. It'll take you right to the podcast uh, where, again, you can download and follow. We talk about the biggest headlines, biggest players, waiver wire moves for that day in just five minutes. So we do appreciate it. Let's talk about the big injuries of the day. Shane McClanahan exited his start due to mid-back tightness and could potentially be a big loss. We don't know the full extent of the injury yet, uh, but he was entering Thursday the SP1 in both head-to-head -head points leagues and in Roto this year, uh, the fastball velocity was down 1.6 miles per hour in the start. Kevin Cash said he hopes McClanahan will be okay after receiving treatment on his back. And the other injury, Brian Reynolds, we knew about this for the past couple of days. He was out of the lineup, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and then was officially placed on the IL with lower back inflammation on Thursday. And uh, he has been a top 21 that's a weird number. He is the outfielder 15 in head-to-head -head points, the outfielder 21 in Roto this season. Uh, that is Brian Reynolds. Uh, I don't know if you guys have anything to add. Obviously, we could talk about some replacements here, but two potentially you know, massive losses in Shane O'Mac and Brian Reynolds. Yeah, I, I think one takeaway here, we, we might be back to streaming against the Pirates. They had a, 
a nice little run, but yeah, that, that lineup looks pretty stinky right now. Henry Davis did hit his first major league home run today, and he's started every game since getting called up. Three of them at right field has not appeared at catcher so far. That's actually a good thing for his fantasy value. So happy to see that. But yeah, Jack Sawinski has been, he's Holy hit a couple up. home runs, but yeah, he's yeah. hitting 163 in the month of June after hitting 207 in the month of May. So I think we're back to him being a little bit of a pumpkin and uh, yeah, pirates lineup is pretty stinky. Hopefully Shane McClanahan is fine. That is the, the well, bigger takeaway. Yeah, I, I mean, when when we let when he left, we didn't know exactly what the the injury was, mm-hmm. and his velocity being down, your mind went to the worst possible place. But if it's a back issue, maybe he goes on the IL. It's probably the standard like four to six week injury. It's it's not something that's going to keep him out forever. So, I, I I don't think that's the worst possible outcome. And and look, maybe it's not even that bad. Mm-hmm. But I'm but I'm saying like if that's the worst it is, then it could have been a lot worse than that. And if he does go on the IL, I don't know that I would completely freak out because the All Star break is coming up. So mm-hmm. to give him a little bit of an extended absence to rest and recover and get ready for the second half, it wouldn't be the worst thing. You know, hopefully by the time we're back on this podcast, it's like all right, he's good to go and there's no issues. Uh, so yeah. wishful thinking there on yeah Shane he Lowe. he could actually he could miss four weeks and probably only miss like three turns in the three or four turns in the rotation. So, you know, the timing for this is never great, but could certainly be worse. And again, if you're looking for replacements for McClanahan, we spoke about Braxton Garrett earlier, 71 person rostered. We'll talk about a few other waiver wire pitchers in just a little bit. And I wanted to talk about some big pitching performances. Obviously Garrett was one of the bigger ones of the day. Uh, And I want to mention on the other side of that game, we did have ourselves a bit of a, Pitching duel. It's time to do, 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 I got some good feedback from it, so <laughs> I'm not going to overplay it. But hey, if we got a, we get a few pitching duels, you will get more Yu-Gi-Oh in your lives. Uh, Mitch Keller at the Marlins, seven innings of one-run ball with five strikeouts, only six swinging strikes on 107 pitches. His velocity down a little bit in the start. The sinker down 0.7 miles per hour. The cutter was down 2.6 miles per hour, and uh, he has had single-digit swinging strikes in four straight. So this is kind of weird because this was a great performance, but I'm using it as an opportunity to talk about how Mitch Keller has kind of been mediocre recently. His last six outings, uh, a 5.2 ERA, a 135 whip, right around a strikeout per inning. Walks have been an issue again. Scott, any concern here on Mitch Keller? It looks like uh, he might be slowing down a little bit. Uh, not major concerns. I, I will point out, like, he hasn't been a big swinging strike guy all year. He's been, like, a mm-hmm. 10% swinging strike rate guy. So below average, uh, or at least average. I, I don't know exactly what average is for swinging strike rate, but that's worse than you usually think of a, a pitcher with his strikeout rate having, a high-end pitcher having a 10% swinging strike rate. So that number specifically doesn't bother me with Keller. I think it's better just to ignore the swinging strikes with him, more or less. Uh, he has given up some more runs lately. His ERA estimators still look great. I mean, he is underperforming all of his ERA estimators. So, and and he's still getting strikeouts. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm not that concerned. He was, you know, he he start he had a 2.44 ERA at the start of this stretch, and and was bound to have some correction from there. I think this is just kind of the ebb and flow of the season, though, and um, I'm not panicking over Mitch Keller. The one thing I would say is he, he might just be more like a strikeout printing guy than a truly high end strikeout pitcher. But given what else he does well, particularly with regards to hard contact and, and the improvements he's made in control, I, I think you live with that. It's just maybe he's not an ace. Maybe he's more like a t- top 25 starting pitcher. And I think for the most part, that's how we've been treating mm-hmm. him. He's right around that 20 to 25 range and all three of our starter pitcher rankings. Um, Just want to point out the league average swinging strike rate is 11% because I haven't looked it up in a while, Scott. And I, you know, I guess that's what I thought it was, Yeah, but I, I, yeah, I hadn't looked it up in a while either. Two other massive pitching performances from Thursday. Joe Ryan bounced back with the first complete game, the first shutout of his career up against the Red Sox. He only allowed three hits, zero walks, with nine strikeouts and 16 swinging strikes 
on a whopping 112 pitches. They really let Joe Ryan go here uh, to try and accomplish this, and he was fantastic. He's down to a 298 ERA, a .91 whip over a strikeout per inning, and uh, like Mitch Keller, his last four starts before this, a 608 ERA. Uh, the whip was still really good during that time, so you know maybe it's just some natural regression. But Chris, I mentioned earlier, I was updating the pitcher rankings. Mm -hmm. I moved Joe Ryan up to SP 13. It might be aggressive, but I, I just feel like we've seen enough at this point this season where like everybody else in that range kind of has some issues. Mm -hmm. So I'm buying in. I moved them up. Yeah, I think that's probably a little aggressive, but I've got him 20th and. You know, guys like you, Darvish and Shane Bieber are still ahead of him, and I could easily jump in him ahead of those guys. So the, the range isn't, you know, outrageous to me. I, I just don't quite have him there. But yeah, he's clearly very, very good. It's sort of a very streamlined two pitch approach. Uh, and, you know, the four seam fastball is a very, very good pitch for him. So it all works. I, I think mm -hmm. because it's such a limited arsenal, I could see there being a point where opposing hitters start to catch up. And, you know, obviously that new, not new splitter, but, you know, refined splitter, I guess, that's become his number two pitch clearly, you know, is maybe catching hitters off guard. And, you know, maybe there will be some regression moving forward. I would bet on that. But I, I think he's going to be very, very good moving forward. Obviously, having a top 20 starting pitcher that's pretty valuable. He went back to emphasizing the fastball on this start, which he's been doing a lot lately two thirds of his pitches were fastballs. They got the vast majority of his swinging strikes. Uh, the splitter was actually down a bit in velocity, which may have been intentional. It may have helped the fastball to play up, but uh, so I have Joe Ryan 16th. I've had him there for a while now. You said 13th Frank, that whole range, like 12 to 20 at starting pitcher is really, has really been tough for me to figure out because it's a lot of like, uh, guys I'm afraid to move down mm -hmm. and and then there are guys below them that I'm afraid to move in like a Merrill Kelly for instance um or Nate Avaldi especially with the way he's been going recently and actually Christian Javier is is part of that range and, and he's right in the thick of that because I, I I had a little back and forth with Eno Saris on Twitter the other day because he was talking about um some concerns he had about Javier and, and was talking about dropping him to like 40th in his starting pitcher rankings. And I'm like, I was like, you know, are they, is it possible we're overreacting here to just a few underwhelming starts from Javier? He started the year strong, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I did move him down to 20. So we talked about this on yesterday's pod. I moved him down to 27. So I, I'm somewhere between the two of you. I, I looked at it again and I kept him at 13th, but like, mm -hmm. that's, that's a perfect example of, of what I'm struggling with at this range of oh, starting yeah. pitchers. Like after you get past the aces who themselves haven't been as dominated, dominant as we're used to seeing them. Yeah. I, I, it's, I think every range of starting pitchers is kind of a mess right now. It's not to yeah. say that it's bad, but it's one, just a different environment. ERA is up like a quarter of a run, I think from last season, if I'm remembering correctly. So like there's just been a, a little bit of a change in how pitching works. And also there haven't been a lot of guys who have been consistently great. And so I look at like every range of starting pitcher and it's like, you know, 25 through 30 is like Pablo Lopez, Logan Gilbert, Christian Javier, George Kirby, Julio Arias, Tyler Glass now for me. And it's like, I don't feel confident in any of those guys, not necessarily that I don't feel confident in any of them. I don't feel confident that I have any of them ranked correctly. Yeah. And it's it's like that at every point. And like, I'm a bigger Blake Snell skeptic than than I think you guys are right now. But I've got him 32. That's higher than me. I know. <laughs> so oh, well, I mean, and, and then after today's start, maybe I should move him that up that high myself. And this maybe is the Bryce thing. Elder should be 12th in my start. Well, and, and but knows? I think this is the thing is that like pitching, especially in season, is always really fluid because pitchers' production and and success fluctuates wildly and then this year it just it feels like i don't really have a good sense of anyone except like clayton kershaw he's awesome <laughs> he's probably got an il stint coming and i've probably got him ranked too low at 18 yeah i moved him up to sp15 chris for that reason he's like yeah. one of the pitchers that is consistently yeah. pitching well this year but uh yeah you do have that risk of injury at some point i was gonna say the cutoff at least for me i, I feel pretty good about the top 
30, 32, if you want to inc include like Hunter Brown in that mix. But after that, to me, it's the Wild West. If you told me you wanted to have Bryce Elder as your 33rd pitcher or Blake Snell, yeah. I have no issue with that. It's Then we get into, at least for me, it's Lazardo, Zach Eflin, Justin Steele, and Stroman. To, to be clear, yeah. like I feel pretty good about Hunter Brown, who I've got in like the 40 range, and Tony Gonsolin. And it's not that I don't feel good about any pitchers. I don't feel good about the the order of them. That's what I'm struggling with this season more than anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, like James Paxton, should he be a top 35 pitcher right now? Oh, you, you could make he it. He looks hey. awesome. Yeah. I mean, if he stays healthy, he's probably a top 20 pitcher yeah, the rest it's, of the way. But you have to factor in a certain amount of injury risk there. Yeah, it's it's just uh starting pitcher this year. I mean, starting pitcher every year, but starting pitcher this year. Yeah. Uh, I use K minus walk rate and Sierra a lot when I'm updating my rankings. And uh, I put the threshold to 30 minimum 30 innings pitched. James Paxton is third in baseball in K minus one. Sounds about right. Yeah. In Sierra. He's he's been amazing. Um, I moved him up to SP 45, but again, he's he's one of the tougher pitchers to rank, as is Blake Snell, who is on one of those crazy runs right now. He was at the Giants, six shutout innings with 11 strikeouts, 22 swinging strikes on 97 pitches. He had at least four swinging strikes on all four of his pitches in this one. And he's down to a 322 ERA, a 123 whip, 104 strikeouts over 81 innings pitched. And over his last five starts, he has allowed one earned run <laughs> with 50 strikeouts uh, and a 17.8% swinging strike rate. So the earlier part of the season when we said, hey, you know, something like this could happen for Blake Snell, it's, we, we've seen this kind of play out too many times in the past. And uh, yeah, yeah. It, it just kind of seems like Blake Snell is back to where we had him ranked before the season. It's just a lot of up and down to get there. So at what point do you cash out? Are we there? It's is it question. time? Like, what I, could you get for Blake Snell? I can't imagine a better three-start stretch by a pitcher this season. I mean, yeah, not even that. He has a 0 0.50 ERA over his last six starts, which is the lowest of his career. I mean, the, the, that's not to say this is the best Blake Snell has ever pitched, but the results right now are just about as good as we've ever seen over a month. So who knows what to make of that, but... You know, it's it's pretty good. And the last two years, when, once he found it, he pretty much sustained it through the end of the season. But one of those years, he got injured well before the season was over. And another one, uh, both times, it was later in the year than this. So I don't know that we can just assume that's going to happen again. Um, but his his last six starts, one run allowed in his last six starts, three straight with double-digit strikeouts. And yet... He has a 455 X ERA also for the season, which is so, like a run and a quarter worse than his actual ERA. And and then the other thing that makes it really hard to figure out is last year it was spam the slider. That's the answer, Blake Snell. We figured it out. We know how to make Blake mm -hmm. Snell good. He just has to throw his slider a ton. And that's yeah. the exact opposite of what he's doing during this stretch. His slider has, I, I what was it today? And his slider was his third most used pitch. It's been below 20% pretty much every start during this stretch. And it's, yeah, it's just confounding or yeah. Is that the right word? That yeah. sounds like the right word. So, I think so. <laughs> somebody in the chat asked trade Snell for Sandy Alcantara. I would definitely do that. I was going to yeah. bring that name up. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'd do that. And I, I moved like Alcantara is in that that range of 12 mm -hmm. to 20 where I'm not sure exactly what to do with them, but I still think they're too good to drop out of the 12 to 20 range. Um, so I get I get why that's possible. And and that that is the sort of deal I would be looking to make with with Blake Snell right now. Like if I could trade Blake Snell as if he is a presumed ace the way Sandy Alcantara is, mm -hmm. then that's that would be enough for me to cash out. If you can't get that return for Blake Snell yet, then let's see how long he can keep this going because another more, another couple more starts like this and you probably can't. Mm -hmm. I was trying to look for a hitter that made sense. It's, you know, Michael Harris's season line is, I know he's had a great June, but the season line still doesn't look great. It's if you could turn Blake Snell into yeah. Michael Harris, would you do that? I'm, I'm not. 
I, I have a lot of faith in Michael Harris, so maybe maybe I should say yes. But like, I, I don't know that you necessarily have to do a buy low, sell high combination. I mean, we brought up the Alcantara example, which is that. But I like you may just be able to trade Snell for a really good shortstop or whatever. It's it's worth looking into. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, let's quickly hit some news and notes, and we will. Wow. Uh, there's a lot of stuff on this run. <laughs> We've been talking a lot. How about that? Uh, interesting news as Rays manager Kevin Cash said Wander Franco will remain out of the lineup through at least Friday uh, due to the way he's handled frustrations this season. Wander Franco, still just 22 years old. Sounds like he's uh, got to work some, on some maturity there. But this was, I don't know, I guess pretty a pretty weird eye-opening report here from Thursday. Yeah, there not a lot of details, but he basically said something along the lines of he's not being the kind of teammate we want him to be. There, there's something going on behind the scenes. They said he's not going to play. Didn't play Thursday, won't play Friday. I would guess he's back Saturday and is back to playing every day, and it's a non-issue, and it's a, a bump in the road. But, you know, he's 22 years old. I, I didn't handle everything in my life well at 22 years old. I'm sure none of us did. So just a reminder of how young this dude is. Yep. Uh, Aaron judge has progressed to pool balance and strength work. That's the latest update. We still don't have a timetable. Walker Bueller threw a bullpen session on Thursday, his first since undergoing Tommy John surgery last August. He is turning a uh, targeting a September return for this season. Sean Murphy appeared as a pinch hitter Thursday, but won't be ready to start Friday's game just yet. He's been hampered by a tweaked hamstring. Lance Lynn was reinstated from the bereavement list and will make his next start Saturday against the Red Sox. Lamont Wade has missed three straight with right side tightness. Uh, Alex Verdugo was placed on the bereavement list and plans to rejoin the team Tuesday against the Marlins. Trevor Rogers remains shut down from throwing, uh, and he was... Um, recently shut down with dis discomfort in his non-throwing shoulder. Will Brennan was out of the lineup with left shoulder soreness. The Mets option Tyler McGill to AAA. No word yet on who will replace him in the rotation. The Red Sox, I missed this yesterday. They promoted infield prospect David Hamilton on Wednesday. Then he made his first start on Thursday, and uh, he has a lot of speed. This season in the minors, was batting 255 with 11 homers and 27 steals. He's 25 years old. He had 70 steals in the minors last season. Scott, is there anything to see here with David Hamilton? Uh, there might be. I, I imagine it would be in a Michael Garcia sort of way if there is, in, in that I don't think there's a ton of upside. Uh, Enrique Hernandez, their usual shortstop, has been terrible this year, so I could understand. Uh, I, I, I see a path for David Hamilton to becoming at least a semi-regular player for them. He bats left-handed, which doesn't help with regular bats. Mainly, I'm not convinced he's a good enough hitter to make a fantasy impact. 25 years old, you know, was hitting 255 at AAA. I spent some time in independent ball, so it's not like he was. he's followed the conventional development path. And, but he's fast, and we'll see how much he plays. And they have said specifically that, like, Enrique Hernandez is no longer their everyday shortstop, so... It could be that they're searching for an answer there. Right. It's a sad, sad day as Willie Calhoun was placed in the IL with a left quad train. <laughs> Willie, we'll always remember you. Uh, and one unfortunate prospect note, Zach Veen underwent surgery to repair a torn ligament in his left hand and will miss the rest of the minor league season for the Rockies minor league affiliate. Let's take our final break. And when we return our week 14 preview here on Fantasy Baseball Today. The PGA Tour's next stop features a fantastic field, including Scheffler, Rahm, and McElroy. The Travelers Championship, this weekend on CBS. Let's get into our Week 14 preview and start things off with the schedule. Thankfully, zero teams with five games next week. 24 teams have six games, and six teams have seven games next week. That includes the White Sox, Tigers, Mets, Angels, Brewers, and Rangers. As for the Rockies, they do have six home games next week, three against the Dodgers and three against the Tigers. Starters sit these two start pitchers. We'll go all the way to the top. Sandy Alcantara at mm -hmm. the Red Sox and at the Braves. Scott, we know he's struggling, and he's got two mm -hmm. really tough matchups next week. What mm -hmm. say you? 
Well, I, I have him out of the top tier, out of the obvious must start everywhere tier, but he's still in that second tier where you're probably going to start him everywhere. I would. Uh, it's it's a tougher call in Roto, I'd say. In points, it's a no-brainer, even with the tough matchups. But um, I think even in those Roto leagues, I'm going to come down on the side of rolling the dice on the ERA and whip to get uh, a lot of innings and hopefully at least one win in those two matchups. All right. Sonny Gray has been slowing down recently. As we mentioned yesterday, he is at the Braves and at the Orioles. Chris, what do you think about Sonny Gray for next week? I would start him, especially with it at Baltimore. That's a good place to pitch. So yeah, he's slowing down, but I, I still think there's quite a bit to like about him. Scott, for people who play in deeper leagues, they might look at Paul Blackburn as somebody who has, he's pitched okay at times this year. He's up against the Yankees and the White Sox. He is in the no thanks tier, the fourth of the four tiers, which, you know, means I'm probably not going to consider him, but he is the very first pitcher in that tier. So it's kind of, it's kind of borderline in deeper points leagues. I'd say whether you consider Paul Blackburn or not. Okay. Well, let's get into the two-star pitchers that you should consider. The ones that we want to add and stream are whom, Scotty? So I was talking about Ranger Suarez as a two-star pitcher last week. And I guess because of the rain out on Wednesday, he's now a two-star pitcher next week. So it's a good thing he came through in that one start against the Braves or else there would have been a lot of mad people. His matchups this week, Ranger Suarez are better at the Cubs and against the Nationals. So that is a really good play. Garrett Whitlock, also in line for two starts. He has been incredible in his last three starts and is trending up for me versus Miami at the Blue Jays. That's good enough for me. Gavin Williams. Uh, his debut was a mixed bag, the way so many of the, the pitching prospects have had mixed bag debuts this year. But there was enough promising there, I think, to go ahead and run him out in a two-start week, especially given the matchups at Kansas City and at the Cubs. Julio Tehran is kind of, you know, Bryce Elder part two here. And uh, he has two starts at the Mets, at the Pirates. I'm going to go ahead and give him the thumbs up for this week. And then I don't think I could do that in a Roto League. Well, that that's what I will say. I, maybe I'm I'm just a coward. Pretty good matchups, though. I, I like it. Yeah, no, yeah, it's, I it's mean, fine the matchups. matchups. Good. Uh, obviously, the main thing Tehran has excelled at is run prevention. So if you have any faith in him at all, I, I don't. You know, it's it's not a situation where it's a big strikeout guy who's going to wreck your ratio stats. You know, right? That's why I I'm saying I don't have faith in him. Okay, just on a skill level. Yeah, that's yeah. fair. Um. Reed Detmer. Oh, okay, so the, and then these are two options that I have in the points league only tier. Reed Detmer's going against the White Sox and the Diamondbacks, coming off his best start of the season. But you know, if he wasn't making two starts, I don't think I'd consider him at all, just given how blah he's been. Apart from the strikeouts, and then Martin Perez, always a good uh, a good streaming type when he's making two starts because he tends to work deep into games. And one of his two matchups this week is against the Tigers. All yeah. right. White Sox and Diamondbacks are both kind of middle of the pack, like 15th and 18th in Woba against uh, left-handed pitchers. So I, I, I would go with Detmers. I would have him over Tehran for sure. And then the single star streamers for next week, four names, Brian Bayo up against the Marlins, Braxton Garrett at the Red Sox, Taiwan Walker, whose velocity has been up recently. He's been pitching well at the Cubs and Brian. Woo. At, home against oh the gosh, Washington. we haven't talked about woo yet today have we i know mm-hmm. i was gonna bring it up right now brian woo up against the nationals he's allowed two earned runs or fewer in three straight he was at the yankees on thursday he went five and a third shutout two hits three walks five strikeouts with 12 swinging strikes and he's had 11 or more swinging strikes in each of his past three starts hmm. uh, chris any latest thoughts here on uh brian woo on- Yeah, 23 strikeouts and 14 and two-thirds innings. Both the fastball and slider look like at least pretty good swing and miss pitches. So I think there's a a decent amount to like about Brian Wu. And, you know, he's kind of gotten overshadowed, I think partially because his first start was really, really bad. Mm -hmm. Um, 
think what was it, four runs in two innings or something. Uh, I'm pretty but, sure that was against the Rangers too. So. Yeah, last three starts have been actually quite good. Two or fewer earned runs in each. A lot of strikeouts, a lot of swings and misses. So I like him against Washington. I think uh, I think he's worth picking up. So that's uh, he has a 5.09 ERA on the season, but he entered the day with a 2.60 expected ERA. That's got to yeah. be one of the biggest disparities in a favorable way. Entered the day with a 16% swinging strike rate too. Uh, his last two starts, which have been his best two now. He's uh, de-emphasized the fastball, throwing it less than 50% of the time, which is probably a good formula because he has a full enough arsenal um, with that slider, like Chris pointed out. And, uh, yeah, he's gotten good results. So with that matchup, I think Brian Wu is a good streamer for this week. And maybe somebody you just hang on to after that. By the way, did you mm -hmm. notice I have Braxton Garrett in there as a sleeper pitcher even going that's, against the Red Sox? Yeah, that's the problem, though, is Boston's – Bottom five in strikeouts against lefties or strikeout rate against lefties and top five in Woba against lefties. So it's, mm -hmm. it's real well, tough, but well, ultimately I think the pitcher has deserved the right to start even with an unfavorable matchup. I think that's fair. Let's slide over to the hitters. Best matchups for next week. The Brewers, Dodgers, Rockies, Tigers, and Rangers. The worst hitter matchups, Giants, Pirates, Angels, Royals, and the Nationals. Scott, with that being said, your favorite sleeper hitters for week 14. So I'm a little underwhelmed by this group overall, especially since we have a full week at Coors Field. I was hoping there were more hitters who could take advantage of that that were available enough to mention here. But uh, my top two both play for the Rangers. I think they're two of the most under-rostered players right now. You mentioned the Rangers have the agree. Fifth best matchups, and they are Leody Tavares and Ezekiel Duran. Duran, you can play at three different positions, third base, shortstop, in the outfield, and he continues to play most every day. Uh, Tavares, I don't know why it's taken so long for Tavares to get picked up. His strikeout rate's low enough that even in points leagues, even in three outfielder points leagues, I think he's somebody worth starting. That's just fatigue, right? That's just like this guy. We've known this guy's name for like six years, and he's never mm -hmm. done anything. Yeah, maybe. I don't. I don't know what it is. Uh, okay, so the Tigers are one of the two teams at course visiting course field this week. They have the fourth best matchups overall. Uh, from their lineup, Javier Baez has been heating up, so I think he's a fine play. Also, Kerry Carpenter, especially when you consider that there is only eh, there are two lefties on the schedule for the Tigers, but in seven games, so he'll have five games against righties. Uh, Tommy Pham has been. On fire for the Mets, he might be part of what's keeping uh, them from calling up <laughs> their prospect, Ronnie Mauricio, who's blanking on the name, Ronnie Mauricio, who's been playing left field at AAA recently. Uh, but Tommy Pham has been hitting so well that what are you going to do? Like, you got to just keep playing Pham if you're the Mets until he cools off, which I think he eventually will, even if you look at his, even though if you look at his stack cast page, it's like blazing red. You know, we've we've been down this road with Tommy Pham before, including just last year. But he's hot right now, and the Mets have good matchups. So he's a fine play, only 13% rostered. I like two players from the Reds because they have only one lefty on the schedule, Jake Fraley and TJ Friedel. They pretty much only start against righties, but they are producing right now and should play a lot this week. Uh, let's see. Guardians. Have pretty good matchups. Ahmed Rosario has been hot, so he's on here. Ezekiel Tavares is the only Rocky who is available enough and good enough <laughs> that I was able to pick out to include a, a, among the sleeper hitters with that full week at Coors Field. And finally, I like Jake Berger this week. I liked him last week, too, and he's done like nothing. It seems like one of, one of those players who's going to be either very, very good or horrid. Hopefully, he'll be very, very good this week. The White Sox have... Um, seven games. They're facing the A's pitching staff in three of them. And he has huge power. So Jake Berger, pretty good start. All right. And where are we using Shohei Otani? I mean, I think the way he's hitting right now, it's not really a choice, but he did just come off a double digit strikeout pitching performance. And the angels have seven games next week. Scott Otani doesn't have two starts next week, right? Um, no, he, he's projected to start Wednesday. Okay. So I think that will come against the White Sox. Uh, yeah, I, I think more often than not, you're 
probably going to use Otani as a pitcher, but probably comes down to uh, what stats you need on your team. Let's wrap up with some leftovers here, and we'll start with some waiver wire hitters. If you lost Brian Reynolds, somebody who still might be out there, surprising, he's only 61% rostered, is Marcelo Zuna, who went one for four with his 14th home run, and since the start of May, 40 games played. He is batting 306 with 12 homers, 30 RBI, and a 15% barrel rate. So, again, just 61% rostered and uh, should be able to provide a, a similar skill set to uh, Brian Reynolds. Obviously, no speed there. I, like he, he might be the most under-rostered player. I know I mentioned those two yeah. Rangers. He, he was so bad in April, batting oh something. Oh, 85. That it's, it's taken a while for his full season stats to look decent, but they do now because he's been so hot for so long and he doesn't seem to be slowing down. He had three balls. He had the home run, of course, on Thursday, but he had two other balls hit more than hundred miles per hour. One had an expected batting average of over 800, but it was an out. Um, so like, he's still, he's still doing great. Moved up to clean up today for the Braves. I mean, started 40 of 45 games in that stretch. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Or played 40 of 45. I don't know if he started all of them. I, I can't guarantee Marcelo Zuna is going to keep it going forever, but I, I don't think it's just a flash in the pan. I think, yeah. I think he seems to have rediscovered himself at least for now. Mm -hmm. And of course, other Brian Reynolds replacements, the names that Scott mentioned, uh, Leody Tavares, I think is a good one out there. Eddie Rosario uh, as well. And in deeper leagues, you mentioned Tommy Pham, who I noticed is playing well. And Alec Thomas uh, is back up for the D-backs and, and he's also been playing well for them. Who would you rather have between Kebrian Hayes and Royce Lewis? Kebrian Hayes went two for four with his fifth homer on Thursday, and in the month of June, he's batting 365 with three homers, two steals, a 933 OPS, and the highest pull rate of any month this season. So you see how those things correlate, right? <laughs> I've said this for a while. Kebrian Hayes, he needs to pull the ball more if he wants to tap into that mm -hmm. hard contact. And he's been doing it this month. And obviously the results have been pretty good. Uh, and then Royce Lewis went two for four with his first deal. He's batting 319 with an 816 OPS. Chris, two uh, third base eligible players here. Who would you rather have? Key Brian Hayes or Royce Lewis? One thing I want to point out, there's a really good piece on fan graphs two days ago on Wednesday about Brian Hayes and just the changes that he's made to his skill set so far this season. I don't necessarily know if they qualify as improvements because... The problem is he hits the ball really hard, but when he hits the ball hard, he tends to only hit it on the ground. And so he still hasn't figured out the, he's elevating the ball a little bit more, but he tends to hit the ball soft when he elevates it. He hits the ball hard when he hits it on the ground. So I would go with Royce Lewis uh, there. You know, he's not playing quite every day yet. And I think they're going to continue to manage his reps, but I, uh, I feel pretty good about Royce Lewis moving forward. All right, you mentioned earlier that Henry Davis hit his first career home run on Thursday. It was 407 feet, and Gary Sanchez has slowed down a little a little bit recently, but he went three for five with his seventh home run in just 22 games played with the hmm. Padres. Scott, one catcher league, if you've been looking no. to stream, uh, I assume we're going with Henry Davis over mm -hmm. Gary Yeah, definitely Davis. They're not even close in my rankings. Uh, you, you say Gary Sanchez had cooled off. He was 0 for 18 <laughs> prior to this. Three hit performance, but still, I mean, that that never seemed like it was going to have much of a shelf life. Mm -hmm. Now, I was just looking into Key Brian Hayes' uh, batted balls from Thursday, and his home run was 97 miles per hour off the bat. He had two other hits, uh, a ground out, which was 104. So, again, that kind of feeds into the theory. And uh, a double, that was 106.7. Uh, that was 14-degree launch angle, so probably more of a line drive, but... Yeah, seems to check out, Chris, based on uh, what you said. A few other waiver wire pitchers here. Uh, J.P. Sears has gone seven innings in back-to-back -back starts. He was at the Guardians. Uh, he allowed two runs with eight strikeouts and 12 swinging strikes on 106 pitches. And we already spoke about Brian Wu. Uh, Scott, do you think J.P. Sears needs to be more rostered than 29%? Yeah, probably more than 29%, given the need everybody has for pitching. Now, his biggest issue is he pitches for the A's, and as I've said a lot recently, the win is the most valuable pitching statistic in fantasy, at least in typical scoring formats. And so it's going to be hard for him to win much with them. But his last eight starts now, J.P. Sears has a 293 ERA, 
a 0.91 whip, 8.2K per nine. I'm not saying he needs to be 99% roster. What'd you say was 29%? Yeah. Doesn't need to be 99% roster, but maybe 59% uh, rostered. I, I would say there's one bigger issue. Uh, he has that? a 57% fly ball rate. I don't know that that's a bad thing, though. Well, he doesn't. It, it'll, it'll help him suppress Babbitt some, but he also he has a two home runs per nine, which is not a fluke, I would say. Not based on that fly ball rate, but playing at Oakland, man, that definitely. Right, that's that's not a bad thing. Has, but yeah, yeah, 14% home run to fly ball ratio and two home runs per nine is like, that's not an outlier home run to fly ball ratio. That's probably I, earned. Yeah, yeah, he'll, he'll, look, he's not, <laughs> bringing this full circle, he's not Christian Javier in <laughs> terms of uh, suppressing batting average with all the fly balls. But I, I do think that is the key to the degree that JP Sears is good. I think that's the key to it is he doesn't allow a lot of hits on contact. Um, but the trade off is there'll be a fair number of home runs. All right. And one other pitching note here, Domingo Herman has allowed Crop. 15 earned runs Crop, over Crop, his Crop, past Crop. two starts. <laughs> his ERA is 5.1. He's gone. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like there are plenty of leagues where you can still roster Domingo Herman. I'm not saying every 15 team league he should be dropped, but most leagues I, I have no interest in rostering him. Domingo Herman, Hawk Harrelson says he gone, he gone, and he gone, and he gone, he gone, he gone, he gone, he gone. That's a pretty long one. He gone. I didn't realize how long I made that. That was uh, something I made. I think the first week I was here on the job, and <laughs> I don't think I've ever played it. So mm, that ambitious. was a really long compilation there. Uh, but the point of the story is, Domingo Herman, you are gone. Uh, what do we do with Jared Kelnick? He went 0 for 5 with three strikeouts in a game that the Mariners scored 10 runs. And I've got to say, that is one of the worst feelings in fantasy. You go to check a box score. You see mm. team scored all these runs that one of your players is on. He goes 0 for 5 with three strikeouts. Uh, since the start of May, 43 games for Kelnick. He is betting 225 with a 36% strikeout rate. He's still 89% rostered. Should that be the case? Yeah, his strikeout rate is up to 36% since the start of May. Um, <laughs> I just said that, Chris. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, that's uh, So, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm i having a hard time saying you should drop him, but I can't make a particularly compelling affirmative case for it's, him. It, it would be a format-specific thing for me. The only reason I, I say 89 might be too high for Jared Kelnick is I'm thinking about three outfielder points leagues where mm -hmm. you know you just don't have to go that deep at the position and the strikeouts do so much to suppress Kelnick's value anyway. Like swapping out Kelnick for Marcelo Zuna in that yeah, format, for instance, okay. like that's that's something I'd be okay with. And I, obviously, Jones. I don't know what the future holds, but my hunch is. You know, as bad as he's been the last two months, Jared Kelnick will have another huge month before the season is over. Like, you know, we, we just because a player is performing a certain way recently, and this is kind of the point I would have made about Christian Javier if I was on yesterday's show, like, doesn't mean that's who he is now. Oh, of course. There is an ebb and flow to the, base, the baseball season, and everybody has peaks and valleys. And just because he struck out 36% of the time over the next two months doesn't mean he's going to strike out 36% of the time moving forward. The he might counter. strike out 30% of the time, but, you know, it's... They're, they're, the I, counter I, there I, would be with regards to Jared Kalanick is he's had exactly one good month the, in the majors. Right? Sure. Yeah, but it was a really good month. And that and, is... no, But it's no longer the most recent month. And his, expect, his season-long expected stats are still very good. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I... I I don't know what the future holds, but that is my hunch with Kelnick is that we haven't seen the last of him being good. Let's wrap up with some bullpen updates here for the Diamondbacks. Miguel Castro got the final out in the seventh inning. Andrew Chafin pitched in the eighth, and then Joe Mantiply started the ninth inning. He gave up two runs, and Scott McGuff came in, got the final two outs for his fifth save. That's his uh, second save in as many days. He's 24% rostered, and uh, I think if you play in... 
a 12 team roto league or deeper and you're desperate for saves i think mcguff is probably the ad for you right now I, i've been picking him up in shallower than that either even nice. i mean i, I think I, he's I, got the last three saves for them now uh he has well he has for the last five i can say for sure and he's finished each of his last six appearances has been to finish out a game all in which a closer would be typically used and his numbers are phenomenal i like i i think scott mcguff might be like a true dominant closer as you know he was showing signs of that this spring he was a closer the last two years in japan and it seems like it's all coming together for him so i am i am i think scott mcguff is is being severely overlooked right now and I picked him up in the Scott McGuff Dynasty League. So I'm hoping that it does work <laughs> out. Uh, please become the closer for the D-backs. For Tampa Bay, Jason Adam got the eighth inning with a two-run lead. He gave up two runs on a walk and three hits. Pete Fairbanks came in in the ninth with the game tied. He gave up a run and took his second loss of the season. For the Royals, Scott Barlow struck out two for his ninth save. And for the Marlins, the team of destiny I have dubbed on <laughs> Twitter. Uh, AJ Puck pitched a clean ninth for his 10th save. And yes, I got some responses like, what about the D-backs? What about the Reds? Okay, yeah, those teams no, are good too. But if you say something good about one thing, it means you think all other things related to that thing are terrible. That's that's the rule. Everyone knows it. The way that I think about it, a team of destiny is like one that has all these late game comebacks and these like one run wins. And, and the Marlins have done that this that year. There's, there's, no, there's no rational explanation. Right. Like the Rays are super talented. It makes sense. The Reds have a ton of young talent. The Marlins are just pulling stuff out of their high knees. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> uh, so I think we're in agreement there. The team of destiny, Miami Marlins. Uh, Let's get into to stream or not to stream for Friday. And yes, if I recall, Friday is a pretty good day. I like mm -hmm. uh, Brian Bayo at the White Sox. Uh, Emmett Sheehan versus the Astros. Mm-hmm. Smith Shaver at the Reds, I think is fine. He looked pretty good in his last start. Velocity yeah. ticked up, had 17 swings and misses. It's yep. sort of a sneaky tough matchup now, but I uh, I will say this. If he does well in this one, we're going to be rushing out to add him this weekend. Mm -hmm. And I think we even I mentioned... Mean, he's, he's already 73% run. Oh, is he? I so, thought yeah. it was lower than that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dane Dunning at the Yankees, I think is okay. It's, it's okay. Yep. On Saturday... Uh, first time I'm looking at this list and uh, not as fun. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Like I, I wish Griffin Canning was not at Colorado. Cause I think that'd be a good one on the road or at home. Hmm. Yanni Chirinos against Kansas city is not a bad one. Uh, that, that chart that Scott was referring to about Bryce Elder, yep. Yanni Chirinos was right next to him on that. I, I noticed that too. Yeah. Um, and Kansas city is a disaster. And uh, Reese Olsen would, against the Twins, I don't mind. Would not be surprised if Dean Kramer was good at home. Yep, those were the ones I was looking at. Olsen, Kramer, and uh, Yanni Chirinos. Josiah Gray at the Padres. Eh. Nah. Eh. On Sunday, uh, not... Actually, yeah. I think it's okay. Seth Lugo versus the Nationals, I think, is fine. That's fine, man. Yeah. Johan Oviedo at the Marlins is okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and Aaron Savali versus the Brewers, I think, is fine. Yeah, those are the best ones. I, I yeah. actually like Lugo the least of those three. I don't like any of them very much, but that's fine. Wow, what would they do to you, Chris? Uh, all they right, know what they did. <laughs> they didn't get enough strikeouts. <laughs> we're going to wrap there for Scott and Chris. I am Frank. Thanks, as always, for tuning in to Fantasy Baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. We'll be back again next week. Bye-bye.